Hi. Um, welcome to the talk about um, practical Android security. My name is Darren Calza. Um, this talk will um, show you some attack techniques that hackers use and, and how you can defend your Android applications um, from being um, hacked in the first place. A little bit about myself before I uh, jump into the presentation. Um, I'm a mobile security expert where I work at uh, Zion Security. I work in a mobile security team um, and I coach juniors and do pen testing myself on mobile apps. I do it uh, on architectural level, so from the design phase, um, but also on implementation level, so after the application has been developed. Um, I also do some big bounty hunting. Um, you can find me on Keybase. These are all my, um, con this is all my contact information here. I, al I also tweet a lot, so uh, a little bit about the company. So um, Zion Security, um, in general, we um, do security consultancy for web, mobile, IoT, and infrastructure. Um, we do pen tests. Um, we, do, we offer secure software development um, services. Um, security consultancy in general, um, in all phases of your company. We are based in Rotslag, Belgium, and that's our website. And now to the uh, biggest part, the interesting part, uh, the presentation itself. So um, I will first give an introduction to the Android platform um, because maybe there are some people that don't um, um, actively develop on Android or don't know how it works under the hood. So first we do uh, an overview of the platform. We'll look at how an Android application is structured, how it looks like uh, once it is um, built or once it is um, um, developed. Um, what the different attack surfaces are of an Android application. So uh, what are the different points of view of an attacker? How do, does he have access to your app or to the data that your app um, generates maybe? Um, and what you have to think about when you develop the app in the first place. Um, then we're going to attack applications statically and also defend them. So first I show you how you can attack them and then some um, uh, techniques how you can protect the code. Um, how you attack applications dynamically, what it means to attack an application dynamically, um, and how you can use some um, Google um, services like SafetyNet, how you can def or, or scan the environment in which your app is running to see if it's potentially a harmful environment. And then we see how you can attack the communications between the app and a backend server you have set up, um, and how you can protect that. So um, first, um, the Android platform. So when you talk about the Android platform or you Google search it, this is the first image you'll see and it basically gives you the overview of how the Android platform stack looks like. So you have your applications uh, on top, which are, which are the apps you interact with, which uh, if you open the app drawer, you see these apps, this is the first layer. And developers use the Java API framework to interact with the Android system. Um, and that framework um, is an abstraction for some native libraries that ship with Android. Most famous one is Stage Fright, which is used for uh, media playback, which has been um, compromised a lot uh, last year. Um, and then some Android runtime, um, so the, the Android runtime, the, the environment in which your app runs, and some core libraries that comes with that uh, runtime. And then you have the hardware abstraction layer, which um, makes an abstraction from um, all the hardware specific uh, interaction so you don't have to um, implement that yourself. Um, and all that works on top of the Linux kernel. Um, that's why we love Android because it's open. Um, it doesn't use the whole or it doesn't use the Linux kernel um, as it is um, um, how you can find it. But um, it has some additional modules um, that they added um, to basically give some functionality that you need in Android. And the most famous um, module that is really Android specific is a binder module, which allows you to communicate between apps um, or you can send intents, which I will talk about a little bit more later. Um, so that's how the Android stack looks like on a device. Now, if you look at how the engineers at Google or at Android have um, implemented security, they base it on two main principles, which the first one is defense in depth. So you have different layers of defense. Um, an example, um, you have your application sandbox, um, but also um, you have your memory um, corruption uh, defenses um, like to, um, to mitigate the fact that an application can um, perform a stack-based overflow um, or, or any other memory attacks that you can think of. 
And also the other um, big principle that they um, use throughout their whole architecture is the principle of least privilege. So every component on the Android stack or in your application has um, enough permissions to do its task and not more permissions. So in the event of that module or component being compromised, there's um, a certain confined um, um, set of tasks that can perform and cannot or should not be able to breach the whole system. How does the Android application sandbox look like? So uh, on this slide you have two applications. So when an application starts, the Android system will create a virtual machine for it. It will load the application in the virtual machine. It will also make sure that some shared libraries are loaded in the memory. Um, and it uh, assigns, so when you install the app, it assigns it a user identifier, which is uh, also common on Unix or Linux file system, which is a mechanism they use to isolate processes. Um, and the same thing happens on Android. So um, application A cannot um, directly um, reference to the memory in application B, for example. And that's um, um, the application sandbox. And since 4.3 um, has been introduced, so SE Linux has been introduced, which um, implements a mandatory access control, um, which gives you more fine-grained control over um, what an application can do. And SE Linux has been um, and 4.3 introduced as um, um, uh, permissive, so it only generated warnings, but from Android 5.0 it became um, um, enforcing, so, uh, which means that um, if you wanted to do uh, an action or your application wanted to do an action that violated as a Linux, um, it, it wouldn't uh, perform the action. So um, that's roughly how the Android application sandbox uh, looks like. And, this is important because um, the fact that Android loads the shared libraries for every virtual machine becomes uh, important later on in the presentation when I talk about how you can attack applications dynamically because these tools um, often use um, this fact that the shared libraries are loaded for every runtime um, to um, attack the application while it's running. A little bit about Android permissions, so everybody knows if you have used an Android phone, you know about the Android permissions. It's a dialog you get, which you have to confirm. Um, and even in the new versions, like from 6.0 onwards, you can revoke permissions um, on runtime. So what does it uh, mean? Um, applications, they need to request permissions to do certain things uh, or to use resources on an Android platform. Um, and it's the task of the developer to request them, and you do that in your Android manifest. And the user can revoke certain permissions on runtime on these new systems. And it's, it basically gives the user control of what an application can access on your device. And this is clearly um, what I meant with the principle of least privilege. Um, the application only gets the permissions or the developer should only require the, the permissions um, that he really needs in the app in the event that the app is compromised that not the, other, that the permissions that he doesn't use are not being uh, um, under the control of the attacker. Android permissions come in three different types. You have API permissions, um, you have file system permissions, and IPC, which stands for Interprocess Communication Permissions. Um, and this is a whole set of permissions that you have on Android. You can also define your permissions uh, self, uh, permissions yourself, but that's a little bit out of the scope. So just for the basics, you have three different types of permissions. Um, the API permission is for ex uh, are the permissions that basically um, do the access control on the Java API framework layer. So if you want to use um, a certain content provider or if you want to use um, a certain part of the framework, you have to request that permission. Um, file system permissions go deeper. Um, for example, um, if you want to use a Bluetooth socket, you have to uh, request a Bluetooth permission. Um, and only if, you have, if that has been granted, you can use the, the Bluetooth. Um, and, and the process permissions is to um, communicate with other applications or with different process uh, components. And all these permissions are met on lower level um, operating system capabilities. So um, on Android you have the ETC petition uh, or um, uh, part of your file system with permissions and then platform.xml and this basically maps permissions to capabilities. So if you have the Bluetooth permission you're put in the Bluetooth group. Uh, the group ID is assigned to your application 
and when the kernel has to check um, if you have access to that resource, it simp simply checks if, you have, if your user ID has been added to the group ID for Bluetooth, for example. Um, and um, as mentioned before, you have to declare the permissions you want to use in your Android manifest. This is an example, I don't know if it's readable. Um, this is an example of internet um, permission that you have require um, access network state um, and Bluetooth, for example. Um, it's really easy, it's, it's self-explanatory. Um, also, thing to note is that when an application um, asks, for example, um, to write to the external storage, it also implicitly, implicitly is granted the read permission. So on Android, if you have the permission to uh, write to the external storage, um, that application can also read the whole um, external storage or internal storage, whatever you're uh, referring to. So that's a, a little background on um, and, uh, the platform. So now we're going to look at Android application because that will be um, the, the, the real focus of this presentation. And when you look at an Android application, the file extension is an APK, which, st which stands for Android package. And when you develop an APK, you upload it to the Play Store or you can sideload it on your device. Sideloading means you have the APK file and you push it through ADB, which is the Android debug bridge on your device. So you don't necessarily have to um, upload it to, to the Play Store and download it from there, which is different from um, iOS. You have to do a lot more work on iOS, for example, to sideload um, an, an application there. Um, any application can be dumped from the device without root. Um, so uh, this means that your APK, basically, um, the, the, the idea that I want to, to uh, um, stress here is that you, as a developer, you create an application and this application is delivered, the whole binary is delivered to the device and it can be a hostile device, it can be a, a benign device, but um, you have to be aware that this code can be dumped from the device and can be interacted with in, in, in thousands of ways. Um, and the first thing to notice here is that it's just a regular zip file. So you can just unzip an APK file and you see certain contents like the resources, um, assets, and you see also the bytecode. And also, every time you upload it to the Play Store, the application needs to be signed. So if you unzip it, um, this might be um, how it would look like. Um, this is a fairly standard um, inside look of an APK. So you have your Android manifest, which is basically, it contains the whole structure of your app, what the entry points are to your code, um, which icons you use, which permissions you use, which activities you have um, declared in your Android app. Um, and it basically says how your app is structured. So when you attack an application or you start to reverse engineer an application, this is the first file you would decompile and look into. Then you have the resource files, um, which is an index file um, to make sure that resources like images and sounds are um, accessed correctly. Um, this is the most important file from point of view if you start reverse engineering the app. It's a clauses.dex file. And this contains a binary blob of all the bytecode that the app contains and that can be executed on the Android device. Um, so when you start reverse engineering, this is the part of the code that you, uh, so here is the code located that you want to reverse engineer. Then we have resources and assets in Android. Um, so with assets, we mean um, PDFs, um, images, videos, anything you would use as an extra um, Thing besides text can also be clear text. Um, but um, these assets, these files are never compiled. They're just copied from your development space to the final APK. And then we have resources in Android because layout files, the way you um, structure a layout from your screens in Android, um, these are all called resource files and they are in this folder. And also on Android, you can implement native libraries in C or C++ which are compiled to shared object files um, or libraries, and they're also um, contained inside the APK and linked during um, when the application is running. How does a build process look like? So um, on Android, you can develop in Java um, source code, um, or you can also develop in C, C++. Um, and then you have your source code and your resource, resource files. They go to compilers. Maybe you have external libraries, jar libraries, or um, the new format is the Android um, AAR libraries. They all go to the compiler, which um, gives you um, the compiled resources. It gives you 
the DEX file, which contains the actual bytecode. And then all that gets signed, and then you have your final APK that is sent to the Play Store. A little bit about DEX bytecode. So DEX bytecode, it's register-based um, bytecode, so um, because the virtual machine in Android is a register-based virtual machine. You basically have two types. You can have a register-based virtual machine or you can have a stack-based uh, um, execution environment. Um, and register-based means that all your argument, arguments or your uh, parameters to a function or a method are passed through registers, whereas on a stack-based machine, um, they are pushed and popped from a stack. Um, it's executed by the Dalvik um, on older versions of Android, but now it's all art uh, runtime. Um, and they are executed inside this virtual machine I mentioned before. Um, and when you install it and while the app is running, um, Android will find the most optimal way to compile that bytecode to native code. And they use the text to out utility, which is loaded onto your device. And when, once the app is installed, um, this dex to out gets the dex files and it will compile it to native code. So this is, has the advantage, it, it's called ahead of time compilation, whereas the previous versions of Android, Dalvik used, it, used just in time, so it will execute bytecode. Now it will compile it ahead of time on the device. It will use device specific optimizations and um, it will compile it to native code so that it runs faster. Um, this can obviously be reversed back to Java source, um, but it's, it might not be that correct. So um, it's also interesting that you learn to read Smalley bytecode um, or Android bytecode. Um, Smalley bytecode is a more intermediate bytecode format. Um, I have an example later. Um, because you can always disassemble code to bytecode format. Um, but if you reverse engineer it or decompile it to Java source code, you might not recompile it, get it recompiled. I mean, the chances are actually really big that you cannot recompile it back. Um, so if you want to uh, change the code or you want to patch the code, the best thing to do it is to decompile it or disassemble it to bytecode and do your modifications on bytecode level. This is an example of uh, Smalley bytecode, just to show you that it's, um, it's a little bit higher than the Android bytecode. So Smalley bytecode is an, a format um, created a couple of years ago um, that 100% resembles the Android bytecode. So it's perfectly translatable to Android bytecode, but it has more um, information in it than just plain text Android um, bytecode. Um, for example, it still has a notion of methods. Um, it defines the parameters that it uses. Um, and then why is it bytecode? Because you can, you can perfectly see that it uses opcodes and registers um, to perform actions. So we, here we have a check cost operation code that will basically um, look up what, what is in register P2 and check if it is of type integer. Um, here is how in Smalley bytecode you do um, um, a call. So in ver invoke virtual, you pass the registers and then um, the actual uh, call that you're invoking. Um, and this is still perfectly readable. It might take you some time to understand it completely, but the advantage here is that you can always change this code and recompile it when needed. Um, and that poses the biggest threat to Android applications because it's fairly easy to do this. So there are click and play tools that basically just reverse engineer to Smalley bytecode. You can do your modifications, you issue the build command and it will make perfect um, APK with um, all your modifications into, in it. What are the um, different attack surfaces of an app? That's the other big part of the presentation. Um, you have um, different attack models. So when you develop an app, um, it can be attacked in different ways. Um, and it really depends on the point of view of a hacker. So does he have access to the APK? Can it be reverse engineered offline or online? Um, by which I mean offline, you um, dump it from the device and you look at the Smalley bytecode like I showed you before. Um, and online uh, means that it's running on the device. Maybe you attach a debugger to it to see how it executes, what the values of certain parameters are, variables. Um, another attack model to your app can be that another app is running on the device without root rights and if you're for example, storing sensitive information in a world-readable directory, then this app can have access to it if it has the permission to read external storage that he gets from the user. 
Another attack model can be um, a malicious app that's on the device but that has root access. Now on Android, if you have root access, means that means that you have access or you can issue any call on Android that might be privileged, then it's pretty hard to write a secure app because um, certain security measures are bypassed on rooted devices um, or an app that has root access can um, access anything basically at once. Maybe your communication between the app and the server is being manned in the middle. Um, that's another attack model you have to consider. What am I, am I sending over the wire? Am I encrypting it? Um, what if um, a man in the middle could um, sniff my traffic or, or um, basically anything between the app and the backend server you're connecting to? And what if the app is um, shut down, it's installed on an app but it's not running and the device gets stolen? Um, what information is left? What, what one is readable? What do you as a developer um, leave on the uh, system, uh, file system of the, app, uh, of the device? So some research questions um, attackers would, look, would use to uh, attack your app. For example, the first thing I would um, ask myself when I get an app in front of me, uh, how, does it, how does it handle authentication, for example? Um, does it use access tokens? Does it store credentials, maybe, username, password? Um, where does it store, where does he store it? Um, does he use proper session management when the user is logged out? Can you still use that user identifier or, or that um, session identifier? Um, how does the app store user data? So we see a lot of apps, health apps for example, financial apps that, that where you generate quite some privacy sensitive data with. Um, how is it stored um, on the device? So which cryptography is it used? Um, where is it actually stored on the device? Where um, are there AP, API keys um, in the app code? Um, are there exposed content providers, which are basically just a database? How does the app communicate? Does it use just plain HTTP? Um, does it use, use HTTPS? Maybe they need certificate pinning. For example, best practice of financial applications would be um, certificate pinning, where you don't trust the SSL certificates on the device, but you as a developer, you can specify which certificate you trust. And that prevents, it, um, prevents an attack like a man in the middle attack. Um, does the app protect itself? Does it use obfuscation or dynamic checks to see if it's running on a hostile uh, device, for example. So um, now I'm going to look at um, how you can attack applications statically um, to give you a sense of how easy it is to attack an Android application. So first thing you do is you unzip an APK file and then you get all these contents like an Android manifest, um, like SO libraries, um, DEX bytecode, um, basically all the components I, I enumerated before. Now if you have SO libraries, um, this is, um, um, you can disassemble it to um, assemble, assembly um, using Rodari 2, Hopper, IDA Pro, um, and you can um, use these disassemblers to look at the native code, for example. I had some uh, clients saying, okay, if I put this secret password, I don't put it in a bytecode, which is easily reversible, but I put it in native code, that's more difficult to reverse. But actually you can just disassemble it as easy um, as bytecode. It might be harder to understand, but it's still perfectly possible to get a string from um, a shared object library, for example. So the bigger part of the application is, is um, developed in Java probably, um, which, where the bytecode is located in the classes.dex file. You have two options here. You can use a tool called dex to jar which basically um, com um, translates DEX bytecode to jar byte to Java bytecode, and then you can decompile it to Java source code. Or you, you can use BackSmiley and Smiley, which are two open source tools, <clears throat> and they disassemble it to Smiley bytecode, which has the advantage of recompiling the app um, and um, makes it easier to recompile the app without breaking it, basically. Then you have your resources, and you can just use a standard Android tool. AAPT is a tool that actually compiles your resources, so all these resources, which are XML files, are compiled into a binary format when you build the app, 
but you can as easily use this tool to decompile it back to XML um, so you can read it more easily. An example is this for, um, where we, the command on top uses apt, which is the Android tool. We use the D for disassembling and we ask for the XML tree of um, this file.apk and we want to decompile the Android manifest and it gives you um, a perfect XML tree um, where you can see which um, permissions um, it has or it requests. Um, ah, and here it also defines the application tag, so um, what um, all kinds of information like what, what's the name of the app, um, which um, entry points are there to the app, um, which activities are there, um, basically all the information that you need to get an ID um, on how to attack this app or what the entry points are. Then this other um, tool is called apk tool. Um, with a simple command apk tool d file.apk, it will decompile all the components in your app. So it will decompile the resources, it will um, disassemble the bytecode to something you can read and um, basically packs it all into a folder in which you can go through. Um, and it's just click and play, it's fairly easy. Um, that just shows you um, that it's not really difficult to get to the reverse engineered code. This is my favorite, it's Bytecode Viewer, and it combines different compilers or decompilers. Um, and in the middle, for example, you have just the bytecode decompiler, so it just dumps the bytecode. It doesn't try to decompile it to Java source code. But these are two um, decompilers that actually try to um, reverse it to uh, Java uh, source code. Um, but the, the thing is that if you decompile it to Java source code, decompilers might crash. So it might not be um, useful to decompile it to Java source code, but then you still have the bytecode in the middle so you can switch between um, um, portions of the code. Um, but whereas this decompiler might crash, but you can always disassemble it, or this decompiler might do a good job. So you can go through the whole clause um, uh, without using one decompiler that might crash. This is an open source tool that I wrote. Um, it's Droid Graph. Um, I wasn't really creative with the name, but it basically makes graphs from code. So. Um, in this example, it um, shows you what the interfaces, how the interfaces are connected, so which clauses um, implement a certain interface. Um, or for example, here we have the main activity of the game 2048, which is an open source uh, game. Um, and we see that it's responsible for um, extending the Android app activity clause, um, which basically means that that clause is, um, contains all your application um, code. Um, typically in this uh, clause also the initialization of um, third-party services is done, so that's an interesting part to look at. Um, and it, this tool is just a basic tool to give you an idea of the structure um, of an APK. Um, so in, in this section where we attack applications, um, the first thing I would want to show is how do we, um, uh, for example, is um, how can you locate bad cryptography use? Um, 101 uh, on, on cryptography, you have two types. You have symmetric cryptography and you have um, public key cryptography. Symmetric cryptography uses one key for encryption decryption. Um, and then you have public key uh, crypto, which uses a private and a public key. And the way you use it, you use these keys basically determines the use case. So you can create a digital signature or you can achieve confidentiality of um, data. So when you look at cryptography in an Android app, um, you could um, think about um, or, or what, what are the research questions that you can use this. For example, which cryptography library is being used here? Is it the, the standard or the stock Android one? Is it Bouncy Castle? Is it Spongy Castle? Um, any other cryptography li uh, library? Um, does it use a hard-coded cryptography key? Um, which you see quite often in uh, applications these days where they hard code the cryptography key into the app code, um, which is bad practice, I'll show you later. Um, does it use broken cryptography, for example? Does it use um, MD5, RC4, um, AES in EBC mode, maybe? And where does the app store these uh, cryptography keys? Um, since now we know Smiley bytecode, I'll give you an introduction. Um, there are ways that you can locate it really easy um, in a couple of minutes. So 
if we trans translate the cipher clause in the Android API, for example, to Somali bytecode, then this is how a clause descriptor looks like. It starts with an L, um, and it's, it ends with a semicolon, um, and then um, all the dots in, in the fully qualified name are replaced with slashes, for with slashes. Um, so these are maybe three interesting clauses. For example, are, is there a secret key object being used? Is there a password-based encryption key uh, spec being used? Um, and if you notice and you have disassembled the Android app to Smiley bytecode, which is always um, which is always possible, then you can just grab on all your Smiley source code and see where the cipher clause is being used. And that leads you directly to the clause or to the portion of the code that uses, uh, for example, this example, the cipher um, object. Now, I did this um, on an app some time ago, and when I issued that command, I basically went to this line. So if you would translate this to Smalley bytecode, you would see that here is a cipher clause being uh, uh, used. Um, and that basically brought me to the clause uh, encrypt, um, which uh, is used for encryption and decryption. And then I saw that they use a static um, or a hard-coded encryption key here. So um, this is bad practice. Um, even though when I talked to the developers, they said, okay, um, we use AES, we use um, best practices um, encryption, um, but then the question I ask is, okay, you want to encrypt something, but you're storing the key basically next to it because this key is being used in all instantiations of the app on all the different devices. So if you know that that app uses that key and you recover or you have access to the data on a different device, then it's fairly easy to decrypt it because you already have the key. So it's not really strong encryption. Um, but I still want to keep in mind this um, cartoon of XKCD. I'll give you a minute to read it. Um, so what happens here is that you have these crypto nerds who say, ah, it uses a really strong encryption. Um, it's not. Um, it's, it's too hard to crack it, and then you have um, what would actually happen is that you would force the user into giving his password or his encryption key. And this really grasps the fact that you can create secure systems, secure apps, but still the user is the weak point in the link. It can um, choose a, a, a weak password, it can lose its password or lose its uh, encryption key, um, and then all your measures. So that brings us to the other interesting part. So how do you defend your applications? So there are some design questions you have to think about when you develop an app. So does the application really need to store this data? So when you have data and you're, you as an app developer, you have that data and you say, okay, at this point, I need to store it somewhere safe. Maybe the first question is, do I really need to store it? Can it be generated on, on the fly when I need it, for example? Um, then from a user experience point of view, do I ask the user for a password every time I want to store something? Because then you don't have to store a password or a key anywhere. That's pretty secure because there's not, nothing to leak, nothing to hack. Um, but the user experience might not be 100% um, as you want it because the user always has to enter his password. So the next question might be, how am I going to generate the encryption key? Or how am I going to manage those keys? Or the basic question, where are you going to store that key on an Android device? Now, these two questions, I can't give a definite answer. Um, I'm a big supporter of asking the user every time for a password, but this is really dependent on how you implement your app. So I'm gonna focus on how can you generate securely a password-based encryption key. Um, I don't know if this is readable, but we basically have a method get encryption key, and we use the password-based um, key derivation function two which is best practice, which basically protects your um, encryption key from being brute forced. This is the password that the user enters, preferably um, every time he wants to store, some, or the app wants to store something. Um, or else you generate this key um, once on installation time or first use, for example, uh, and then you store it in a secure way. For example, the key store. Um, and you basically, if you want to use password-based key derivation function, you have to specify the iteration count, which is basically the work factor. So um, the higher this factor is, the longer it takes to generate the keys, and this means that it's harder to brute force the key also. 
because you deliberately um, stretch the, the process of generating the key. Then you specify a salt. The salt is now being securely randomly um, um, generated, but once this is generated, you obviously store that salt, and this doesn't really have to be stored uniquely, uh, securely, um, but you have to generate it somewhere and store it somewhere, and uh, preferences maybe of the, of the app. And then using those uh, parameters, you can instruct um, this, the key factory to generate the, the key, and you return the encoded form. Now that you have a secure key, how do you securely manage them? Which is the biggest part in cryptography, um, in crypto systems these days. It's not um, generate strong keys, that we know how to do that, but how do you manage those? How do you make sure that the keys are there when you need it? And how do you make sure that they are stored securely? First one, as I mentioned before, you ask the user for a password and you generate that key when you need it. So this minimizes the attack window to the Encryption key only being a memory, so the attacker has to have access to the memory um, to dump the key from memory. It's not being stored anywhere, it's only available in the runtime memory. Now, that might not be good for user experience, so you might want to generate your keys and you store it in the key store on Android, which is similar to the keychain on iOS. Um, on newer devices, it's hardware back, and even on rooted devices, it's relatively hard to um, extract keys from the key store which you haven't created. So um, that's the second best option. So maybe a side note, I ordered these to what you sh certainly should do and what's not the way to do it. So the third um, option you might use is that you generate a key and you store it in the shared preferences. So in Android, you have your private directory. Your app has a private directory, only your app has access to it. Um, but on a rooted device, this is not the case anymore. So if an app asks for rooted, root access and he's granted root access, then he can go through all the directories of all the, different app, uh, of all the other apps on the device and he can just read out the shared preferences file. This means if you store your key there, then it's obviously readable by all apps that have root access. And that's why I said in the beginning uh, why the attack model is important when you design a secure application. So what are you protecting against? Are you protecting against an app that has root access? Or are you protecting against your app running on a device where apps cannot get root access, for example? Um, other developers use a hard-coded key for cryptography. So I get where it comes from. So you're developing this, this secure storage implementation and at some point this API needs a key. And then you say, okay, how I'm going to specify this key? Ah, I'll hard code it in the code because it's difficult to reverse engineer an app. Well, that's not the case. Um, you're using one key. All your users are using the same encryption key. So the app is using the same encryption key. So the hacker only has to do the effort of reverse engineering the app once. The key is le leaked and you have quite a big problem because all the apps are using the same encryption key. Or you generate the key securely, you use password-based key, uh, password-based uh, encryption keys, um, but you store it on the SD card, which can be readable to all apps, even on not non root devices, so you shouldn't do that. Now, a big part of your, your, the security in your, in your Android application comes from the ability to protect your code from being reverse engineered, or it can always be reverse engineered, but basically you have to make sure that you have a secure architecture, that you use a secure development lifecycle, and that you obfuscate your code. So what do I mean by the secure architecture? Um, you have to decide which code is running in the app, which code is running in your server. Maybe you develop a, an awesome algorithm, but you put it in the app, you risk it being reverse engineered, so you might be more confident putting it on the server. And Again, I want to stress, does the data need to be stored on the device? The data that is generated in the, in the application doesn't need to be stored on the device. Then um, the next step is, do you have a secure development lifecycle? For example, um, do you have mechanisms in place to alert you when you're using outdated or vulnerable libraries? Um, do you do security code reviews, meaning you have another, um, you do pair programming, but you focus on security, for example. Um, you can use lint checkers for that. Android has some lint checks in place to um, say if you're doing something insecure in Android. 
Um, and you can, on larger applications, you, you should schedule regular penetration tests. Um, for example, every year you do an extensive penetration test or every time you roll out a new um, application. So the other big part of protecting your application code is using obfuscation. You can use code renaming, um, which renames classes and, and methods to something that doesn't really say much for an attacker. Um, you can obfuscate your strings, which means that you can encrypt those strings um, and basically only make the strings available in memory um, when you need them. So not um, storing them in plain text in your, in your app. You can use API call hiding where you use um, the Java reflection framework to hide certain calls to the API because Android API calls, you cannot obfuscate them because at some point your Android runtime needs to know which Android API you're calling to. But then you can use API call hiding. Um, I'll give an example later on how you can use that. Um, code flow obfuscation is where you mangle code to make it more difficult to, to understand how the code flows. So you use a lot of jumps, you use a lot of uh, if else statements. Um, that really mangles the structure of the code. Then you have class encryption, which encrypts whole classes, because in Android you can dynamically load classes, um, and you basically encrypt those classes on build time, and you introduce some decryption mechanism that loads the classes um, dynamically. So you make the, the, the key concept here is that those, that code is not available statically, so when you reverse engineer, when you disassemble it, you don't see the code. But when you're running it, the code will be placed in memory and it's only available in memory. So you as an attacker, if you want to get access to that code, you, can, you have to dump the memory um, of the application while it's running. Um, and then resource and assets encryption. So on Android, you can also, there are ways to encrypt your resources and encrypt your assets. And now I'm gonna show um, with an example, if you use different layers of these code protection techniques, um, how you can um, <clears throat> make it more difficult to uh, make sense of, of code um, when, once you reverse engineer it. Um, so um, in this example, we have this method, encrypt sensitive message, where we have the nuclear launch code that we want to transmit, and we're using the secret key, which is a, uh, the encryption key, and we have somewhere a crypto engine that encrypts the nuclear launch code with the encryption key. Now the first step would be that we use API call hiding. So as I mentioned, you can use Java reflection to basically um, remove the, the class name here from, um, from your code, so crypto engine.encrypt. Instead of um, declaring it statically, you can declare it dynamically, like creating a class dot for name crypto engine. And now the important parts of the API call that you want to hide are becoming strings. Because the class name is a string here, you get the method encrypt, um, and now you have a method object, a class object, and you invoke uh, the method on that. Um, why is this uh, interesting? Because the second layer that you would um, deploy in your code would be string obfuscation. So for example, you could use base64 to encode the strings, and then you have to inject the base64 decode method uh, routine. Um, and that translates it to this. So the API call is already gone in this part of the code. So we only have base64 encoded strings. We have a Java reflection frame, but we still have the field names, the method names that give a lot of information. So the third layer would be that you use um, shorter names, which doesn't mean anything. Um, but if you look at the code now, you don't have any idea what it is doing. Um, it's creating a method object, it's creating a class object, and it's evoking a method, and we only see obfuscated strings in there. So we go from this, that if you apply three layers, you go to this, and makes it a lot harder to make sense of the code. So if you want to attack this, you first have to um, figure out this is base64. Now it's easy because you have the trailing um, equal signs here. Um, but then you have to um, decode these strings. Then you have to figure out why, uh, what, what um, connections there are between these classes. And then you, you figure out that you might figure out what the actual API call is. But the idea is here that you raise the bar for a reverse engineer um, to make sense of the code. Another um, 
technology are packers which encrypt your code um, and they implement a sort of bootstrapping code that decrypts your code and loads it dynamically. So um, you have the notion of clause encryption. Um, apply that to the whole APK. So um, the whole code is being encrypted and loaded in memory. Um, so if an attacker wants access to your code, he needs to dump the memory. So now we're going to, uh, so the, the previous part was how do you attack and defend your application um, against reverse engineer or against static attacks. So now um, let's look at how you can attack your application dynamically, so while it's running. And what's the motivation behind this? Um, the app might protect itself, it might use these obfuscations that I mentioned before, it might use string obfuscation, it might use API call hiding. So you might want to monitor the app while it's running to see which API calls it is calling. Um, or you need some runtime information. Um, for example, you want to leak the key that is generated or you want to um, see um, what the content is of certain variables. Um, you want to trigger other code execution paths in the app, for example, um, if, you, um, if you cannot true user input managed to execute certain parts, you might need um, dynamic instrumentation tools to do that. Or you want to test internal APIs in an SDK, for example. Um, there are a whole array of different tools that you can use. Um, there are hooking frameworks, um, or just the really simple LD preload. You can uh, native code or, or SO binaries. You can use LD preload which basically allows you to link libraries um, and override um, library functions in the app that you want to attack. Um, so it hooks certain, uh, for example, libc calls. You can use Frida or Exposed on Android, um, which I'll go into more detail, which are um, instrumentation um, frameworks or hooking frameworks. Then we have emulators in which you can, um, you can basically load your own Android runtime on those uh, uh, emulators and you can um, inspect the app better while it's running. Um, the, most, the one that I like the most is a Nathan emulator. Um, it's built by uh, MobileSec or MSEC Lab, I think. Um, and it comes preloaded with exposed um, and it comes preloaded with some um, tools that allow you to uh, easily inspect um, an app, for example, it automatically um, removes the SSL pinning in the app, which I'll come on later. Um, and, and it has all um, cool stuff on it that help you uh, in, in testing the app dynamically. There are some debuggers that you can use, Rodari 2, IDA Pro, um, which attach to the process while it's running on the device and it, um, debugs the app while it's running. And then you have man-in-the-middle proxies that allow you to grab or, or read the communication between um, the app and its um, backend server. So what is Frida? It's one of my uh, favorite tools. It's a dynamic instrumentation toolkit. And it's, uh, it allows you to debug a live process. So it attaches to a process. And it has a way to inject a JavaScript engine. So it injects a whole JavaScript engine in the process of the app. Um, and it allows you to hook or instrument or interact with the app by writing JavaScript files. Um, it's built in a server client architecture, so the server runs on your phone. Um, on your laptop that you use to attack the app, you have your client code running that can communicate with the server. An example here, we have a Python script. Um, we get some arguments here, like the script na name that we want to, in that we want to inject, um, or file descriptor to get to the script, and the process name, uh, which is the name of the app that we want to attack that it's running on the device. We define a callback function, and this function will be called every time we hook a certain, or we want to send information back from the phone to the, lab, to the computer, to the PC. Um, we use the Frida API to connect to the phone, um, we uh, use the Friday API uh, to create the script to inject it. And then finally, we say, okay, every time I send a message, use the all message function I declared here to output the information. And then we load the script, and this actually signals um, Friday to inject the, the JavaScript into the app. 
In this example, um, I use JavaScript to hook the um, uh, load URL method of the WebView class. So in Android, you have a WebView class, um, which allows you to render websites inside of the an app, basically a, a self-contained little browser. Um, and it has a load URL method that, the web view, that you can use in WebView to load a different web page. Um, it takes as a parameter a string um, object, and with this JavaScript code at Friday, we basically say, okay, hook the load URL method um, and print out the this URL that you're loading inside the web view. Um, so, uh, and then we send it back. So here we send it back to the laptop or to the PC on which the client code is running. Um, and that will call the all message function which we have declared. And then we call the original function, the load URL, the original function, um, so that the app um, continues normally. So how do you execute this? You basically say, I uh, use Python to uh, execute a script. You say, okay, hooks.javascript, uh, which is this, this snippet, is my script that I want to inject, that I use to hook the application. And I want to um, run it on this app, com.example.webview, which is an app that's running on the device. Now what happens, every time the app will use the method load URL, it will print out the parameter uh, or the argument that you have passed to the load URL method. And this is interesting because it allows you to interact or to um, uh, see the flow of the app and see um, what it is loading in its web view. And you can be really creative with this. For example, you can say, um, you can hook, for example, the, uh, a method that will um, encrypt sensitive data. Before it encrypts, you dump the clear text that it wants to encrypt. And that gives you a sense of, okay, maybe it's uh, encrypting useful information. Um, uh, and it might give you other pointers to look um, where to look in the app. And also, um, additionally, um, you don't have to decompile the app. Okay, you might need to decompile the app to see what you want to hook, but you don't have to recompile the app. You can just leave the app running. Um, you just need to root a device, so you have to root your device. You have to install Frida, which is really easy. And then you can interact with the app in this way just by writing JavaScript. Um, that's really a fast and fun way to interact with the app and let it do things that you um, want it to do. Now the exposed framework is a, another framework that you can use to attack an app while it's running or to hook certain parts in the app and um, specifically allows you or it's developed to hook method calls um, in the app. Um, you implement a hooking module so you have to create an APK which is called a hooking module and in that module, you define which app you want to hook and which method you want to hook. And then you have two sections before the method is called or after the method is called. Um, the control flow is passed onto your own code. Um, this advantage here is that you have to build the APK for hooking, um, which is not the case with Friday. You can just inject everything you want. Um, and the way this works is a little bit under the hood, but um, that's why I said that it's important to know that shared libraries are injected in every virtual machine. So Exposed also only works on a rooted device. And it works because it um, alters the way the virtual machine is created on Android. So it injects itself in every virtual machine by injecting the exposed bridge.jar and it allows that to communicate over apps, which allows the actual hooking to happen. So, now we do the same thing with the com.example.webview, but we create an exposed module um, to do that. So uh, I'm implementing a clause example here, and um, it implements the, the exposed hook load package uh, interface, and it, it requires me to implement the handle load package um, method. And the first thing I do is, okay, I check which app is, am I being called on, um, only if I'm called on the com.example.webview, I will execute my hooks. Um, so we pass this check, and then we say, okay, find and hook this method, um, which is the load URL, which takes a string argument in the uh, webview class. And then I say, okay, um, implement a new um, exposed um, method hook. Um, and then it says, okay, what will you do before it is hooked, and what, what, what do you want to do after it's hooked? So for this little experiment, um, I instructed to get uh, the URL from the parameters that are passed to the method. Um, and then I said, okay, lock which URL is being um, loaded inside the web view. So this has the same effect, so we can trace which URLs are being um, um, loaded inside um, the web viewer here. And it has the same effect as Friday, only the small difference is 
that if you use expose bridge.log, it gets logged on the device itself. So you have to look at the log files on the device itself, so with logca. Whereas with Frida, it would come on your screen uh, where your server code is running. Um, so now that we, I showed you two different um, tools basically to um, attack your application while it's running, you might want to see, or, or you, the, the important part is also how can you defend your application. Um, and there are quite some techniques out there or uh, commercial products or also open source products um, that allow you to do that. Um, you have, for example, root detectors and they use different, um, so it, the code runs on the client itself, on the, on the device itself. And it basically looks at different values of um, the system to determine if it's rooted. For example, are certain partitions writable that shouldn't be writable? On a rooted device, certain partitions might be writable or, or that shouldn't be writable. And that might indicate the fact that the device is rooted. Um, or maybe the super user um, APK is installed, which is a quite popular application that, is, um, that runs on rooted devices. So if that application is installed, that might be an indication of a root device. Um, then you have emulator detectors, which um, allows you to detect if you're running on the Android emulator by looking at different um, parts of the information of the build. Um, so on the build of the Android device, so you can ask which Android version is it running, which build version is it running. And if you're running on an emulator, you might have certain strings in there that indicate that it's an emulator. Um, another trick on emulators is to look if the goldfish shared object libraries are being loaded, so the goldfish.so library, which is an emulator or, or the, the emulation library that's being used by the Android um, standard emulator. You can use integrity checkers to see um, which is basically, which, which is, uh, is uh, intertwined with a uh, certificate check which, where you basically look at has the APK been changed between uh, me building the APK and the APK running on the device itself. So while it's running, it can check, okay, which certificate has been used here in this APK um, and um, is it the same as when I built the APK? And if it's not the same, then you might say, ah, okay, this has been decompiled, it has been uh, recompiled, it has been changed, um, and it's not the same as when I built the uh, APK. So I do something different. Maybe I shut down the app or I switch off features maybe. And then you can also use the safety net API, um, which is um, my favorite at this point because um, for all the above, there are some open source repositories that show you how to do it, but the really good ones are all commercial products. Like um, um, there are different obfuscators that you can use um, that, that also have this dynamic protection um, capability. Um, but the safety net API is something provided by Google. And so I will go in more detail in this presentation how you can use the safety net API to um, detect if the device is um, um, it's not a hacker device or a device that has root, access, uh, root capabilities, for example. So what is the safety net API? It's, um, it's basically you're asking Google's uh, opinion on the device. So um, Google um, has lots of ways to track your device. It has a lot of information on your device. Um, and you basically ask Google's opinion on the device. And it's a form of remote attestation. So um, you... Um, you launch the a test um, uh, API call and then uh, Android uh, or Google code will take over and it will do certain checks and it will give you back a result which you can cryptographically verify um, if it is Android compatible and if it passes the integrity check test. So um, the first one is basically um, Google defines certain um, guidelines for devices to be Android compatible. This means not rooted devices, non-emulators, um, no custom ROMs, for example. Um, so if it passes a compatibility check, you know that it, it, uh, the device is compatible according to Google um, guidelines. And it also has the integrity check um, recently added that basically um, says if the device has been tampered with, has the bootloader been unlocked, been, been unlocked um, or has verified boot been bypassed or something. Um, and the good thing here is that you can cryptographically verify it because you can 
uh, at the result, which is a JSON web signature, you can see um, if it has been um, issued by Google um, itself. So if, if Google had, has done the verification of the device. Um, and it gives you a fairly good protection against dynamic attacks uh, without the need of purchasing commercial products. So how does it work? You, um, you first you generate a nonce, which is uh, commonly used to prevent replay attacks. So um, that you don't get, so you can't reuse this result uh, a second time later in time. So um, how do you use uh, the Safety Net API? You can use the Google Play services for that, which is an SDK provided by Android. And you basically say, okay, um, Safety Net, Safety Net API dot test, and you um, pass it the nonce and you pass it an API client um, object. Um, and uh, re you implement the result callback, which gets called um, when the result um, is being um, returned. And you can check if it, uh, is it successful or did an error occur here um, while communicating with the service, for example. Now, what is the result? What do you get back? You get back your nonce, which you have um, passed, obviously. Um, you get uh, the timestamp from when the verification has been done. Uh, the package name of um, which app it has, uh, has requested this um, safety net um, API test, um, the digest of the certificate, so a hash of the certificate, um, so you can see um, uh, which, uh, which the certificate the APK has been signed with, um, a digest of the whole APK, um, and then these two binary answers, whether it's um, it's compatible, um, so it matches the compatibility um, uh, rules of uh, Android, Google, and if the device has um, basic integrity. So, um, th which means the device has not been tampered with. How do you validate this um, JWS um, response? Um, you extract the SSL certificate chain from it. And then you validate the SSL certificate just as you would do with um, SSL um, validation when you talk with a server. Um, and you use the certificate um, to verify the signature of the whole um, um, JWS uh, response to see if it has not been tampered with uh, or, or what the initial uh, or what the actual contents was that Google has intended you to receive. And you check if the data matches um, um, the data within your original request. So you check the nonce, you check the timestamp, the package name, and the, the hashes, basically. Um, now, there are two ways to, to implement this in a secure uh, uh, There are two ways to implement it. You have an insecure way, and you have a secure way. So the insecure way would be that you generate the nonce on your device itself. Um, you uh, ask Google Play services to do an attestation, you get a result back. You then say, okay, validate the JWS, you can validate uh, also using the SDK, to validate your signature. It gives you back a result, you, um, you check the contents, you check the nonce, you check the, the digest, you check the certificate, um, and then you communicate with your web service if you have a web service um, and do anything the app wants to do. So can anybody see so if you know the previous attacking um, techniques of attacking an app while it's running, can you see how an attacker can bypass this check? Just over the code that does the validation and all this is true. Yeah, exactly. So the problem here is that you do the validation somewhere on the device itself. So um, this runs on the device itself. You generate the nonce here. You do everything of the validation on the device. So you can use these hooking frameworks to basically see somewhere is there a Boolean method that returns um, safety net true as true, for example, and you return it always to let it return always true. So that by, that gives an attacker the chance to bypass it. So what's the secure way to do it? You do the validation on your service, on your web service to which your um, um, app is communicating with. Um, so you ask the web service to get a nonce. Um, that server stores the nonce with your session of your app that's co communicating with the, with the service. Then you include this nonce in your attestation request to Google Play services, you get a result back. And that result, you pass it back to your web server, so you don't do the validation on the mobile app side, but you do it uh, on the web service that is responsible to communicate with the Google Play services. Um, or it, you can also validate it yourself. Um, then you get a result back on your web service, you validate it, and then 
you determine if um, the, the, that instantiation of the app um, has passed safety net. Um, why is it better? Because it's harder to, uh, so there's nothing to hook here. Client side, you cannot hook. The server will determine, um, is this um, uh, a valid device? Um, and you can basically, you can, for example, tie it to your authentication uh, mechanism. For example, uh, only do a valid authentication if it also passes the safety net API. Um, and, and if it doesn't pass the safety net um, test, then you don't allow the app to communicate with the server. There are, however, some disadvantages with the Google Play Server, uh, with the safety net API. And the first one is that you have a dependency on the Google Play services. So maybe you don't want to have a dependency with Google Play Service, which might be a, a valid reason uh, because they do a lot more than just the safety net API. They also um, collect different um, metrics or, or any other objection. Um, you have the dependency of a web service. Um, you have to communicate, you have to set up the validation on your web servers, which also means that you have to um, have information about the APK on your web service. So if you update the APK, you also have to update the web service because it needs to know the digest of the APK, it needs to know the certificate, um, it needs to keep track of the nonce in the, in the session state. Um, so there's quite some dependencies there. And also you only get a binary answer on whether it's compatible or not and whether it's, the, it passes the integrity check or not. You don't know why it has failed. You don't know why, maybe it's just, it's an emulator, but it's not rooted, for example. Maybe you want to run on that, or maybe it's, 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 uh, it has a, a certain exploit. Um, maybe you want to run that because that exploit doesn't affect your app, for example. But you don't know that. You only get a binary answer back. A network request takes time. It, it takes more time to do the request over the wire than do the, the request in your client side. Um, and you, as a developer, you need to validate that JWS um, result. But it's still, it's still um, um, a fairly good protection against um, dynamic attacks because you rule out any devices that are not compatible or not, don't, don't pass the integrity check. Now you can also attack the communications um, of an app and a server and basic uh, SSL, uh, you probably know this. Um, so you have a SSL certificate, which is a cryptographically secured piece of information. So you can cryptographically verify the identity of a server. <coughs> um, certificates are issued by certificate authorities. Um, and your Android device basically trusts a set of these root CAs, um, which are, um, are the, the servers responsible for issuing uh, certificates to intermediate CAs, which are responsible of issuing your SSL certificate. It's the same thing with browsers. Browsers also have a set of root CAs that they trust. Um, and the SSL validation um, exists from, is, is basically um, checking if the certificate from the server um, is a trusted one. Now the problem with this is on Android, um, your application trusts all the SSL certificates on the device. This also means that if you have a root of, if a malware manages to install a certificate or an attacker has physical access and you can install a certificate, he can man in the middle all <coughs> your communication. So you as an app developer, you can say, okay, I want to control which certificate. And, and why is that important? Because you might have a man in the middle attack being possible. Where you talk with a man in the middle, you think you're talking with the server, but um, this man in the middle returns its certificate and it somehow uh, manages to make your device um, trust that certificate. So now you're talking with the man in the middle while you, your app thinks it's talking with the server. Why do you want to do a man in the attack? Maybe because it allows you to test, discover, or first certain APIs because you can change network requests. Um, but this might also be introduce a privacy leak um, for your um, user's data that you send over the wire. How do you achieve a man in the attack? You can install a trusted user certificate, um, or you can hack a CA uh, if you have uh, time left. <laughs> um, or you can install a trusted system certificate on Android because on Android 6.0 and above, um, um, they don't, the user certificates are not trusted by all apps anymore. Um, so only system certificates are trusted by all apps, but then you require root access. Or you can develop a zero day, which gives you root access to a device and you can install your own system certificate. How, does a, how can you set up a man-in-the-middle attack yourself on your own uh, PC? You start an emulator, for example, 
I suggest you use an emulator on Lollipop because then you can still install user certificates. Um, you specify the emulator to, go, to send everything um, to localhost 3030 and on that port you start up man in the middle proxy. And it allows you to basically intercept everything between the app and the server. Um, so I, I, I removed some things because um, this is an app I uh, reverse engineered, but um, maybe the developer doesn't want me to uh, expose it, so I'm, some identifying information has been uh, canceled out. But it still gives you an, an, a perfect uh, view of what you can intercept. Um, so with man and middle proxy, it's pretty lightweight. You can write your own scripts, so it works on Python. You can write your own scripts. A script, for example, could be every time a user identifier is transmitted to example.com, change it to AAA, for example. Um, it's a, I, I like the tool, so th th this is now for research purpose, but you can imagine that an attacker can man in the middle of your app, so you want to make sure you, um, you uh, control your own uh, um, communications. Um, okay, defending communications, that's a typo here on the slide, so what you can do is SSL pinning, um, and you as a developer choose which certificates you trust and you have two options to do that. You can pin on the public key of the certificate or you can pin on the whole certificate. And technically on Android how you can achieve that is you override the trust manager. But what's the difference between public key pinning and certificate pinning is that with public key pinning you can still rotate the, server, the certificates on your server without the need of updating your app because you can keep the public key static and you can change your certificate. But if you um, uh, push the whole certificate with your app, then you have to update your app every time you update your server certificate. Now, this is the wrong way um, of doing SSL pinning, which has been done in a lot of libraries. Um, and basically what it does, it, um, it overrides the check server trust set, which you have to do. So that's not the, the wrong part here. But it, um, it goes over all the certificates in the chain that it receives, and it checks if, it, um, if, it com if it's equal to a certain certificate it's pinning on. That's basically what it does. If it doesn't find a, uh, a pin uh, a pinned certificate, it throws a certificate exception and saying, okay, you're being man in the middle because I cannot find the certificate on which I'm pinning. Now, from a first sight, this might be a reasonable, secure implementation, but um, Maybe somebody knows what's wrong with this. If you, don't, if you didn't read about it, it's really difficult <laughs> to know uh, what's wrong here. Um, because even the biggest libraries um, were affected by the CVE. And the problem is basically, um, so the problem is that you go over all the pins and you trust that this certificate chain is a clean certificate chain so that you have the only uh, the certificate chain of the server um, you're communicating with. But Let's look at this situation where Mallory is the man in the middle. Alice wants to talk with Bob, and uh, it's, it somehow gets, gets connected to Mallory, um, and it says, um, okay, client, hello, send me your servers, so, uh, certificates for your servers. Um, Mallory does a client hello to Bob. Bob sends his certificates. That's just public information. You can get the certificate of any server. Then Mallory packs all the certificates with um, Bob's certificates, and it sends um, that whole package to Alice. Now Alice just iterates over all the certificates and says, ah, okay, I find Bob's certificates, I'm pinning on Bob, so I know I'm talking to Bob. But it doesn't realize that it's just, um, that it's iterating over all the certificates without cleaning the chain. So that was what the problem here was, it just iterates over all the pins, um, over all the certificates in the chain without cleaning the chain. So it's important that you clean the chain first, that you only use the certificate chain of the server you're communicating with, um, and that you start pinning on that. Um, and this was um, a vulnerability a couple of months ago. Got the CVE and um, a lot of libraries were affected um, so hard because the problem basically lies in this um, method here, check server trusted, which is Java API. And the chain you get here contains all the certificates, not only the certificates that are used in the handshake. So it contains all the certificates that were sent from the server to the client. Um, or you can use SSL pinning libraries um, if you don't want to implement that yourself. Um, and from Android 7.0 and upwards, 
you have the network security config file in which you can describe which domains you're pinning on, which um, pins it should use. Um, and um, the network, uh, the, the Android system will take care of only allowing that connections in your app. Um, or you can use libraries because if you, 7.0 is, is fairly new still. So if you want to target older, um, older devices, um, you can use the Android pinning from um, Moxie, for example, which is a really good uh, SSL pinning library. Or it also has built-in support in OKHTTP, which is one of the biggest um, uh, used networking libraries in Android. And I believe it's also incorporated internally in Android, so they, they basically use the open source project in the Android networking API under the hood. Um, Okay, some key takeaways here. Um, so we're nearly the end of um, the presentation. Um, so what I want you to do, take home from this um, presentation is basically that mobile application hacking or reverse engineering of mobile apps, it's, it's not hard. There are a lot of tools to do that, that automate the whole thing. So um, you have to really invest time to think about what is a secure design. Um, Think about the advantages, disadvantages of putting code client side or server side. Um, apply a layered approach to your security. For, protect your code statically. Protect it dynamically using safety net. Um, and also, uh, my final piece of advice is make sure you hack your application first. So um, before you publish it, hack it yourself. Try to see what information I'm getting out of the APK here. Um, you can use these click and play tools. Um, and you might already get a sense of, of, okay, things might not be as secure as I thought they would be. Some references, the Android Hacker's Handbook. Um, it's a little bit outdated, but it's still a pretty decent um, um, solid foundation. The Android Internals, um, I think it's by Jonathan Levin. Um, DroidSec.org, which is a non non-profit, I don't know. It's an, it's an organization of, of, of Android security researchers that combine different um, resources and different presentations and some people um, that you can follow uh, on Twitter and John Koizerakis, I think is a correct name, is the guy that uh, founded the SSL pinning vulnerability I talked about uh, at the end of the presentation. So uh, that's it for me. Are there any questions? No. Yeah. So what did I see all of the vulnerabilities you described today were very close to the Android server that were more general, general also available in iOS. Yeah. Can you make a quick comparison which faction is actually also more on iOS, which one is more specific to iOS? Yeah. So um, on, on iOS, you have a perfect, uh, you have a pretty secure execution environment um, on non jailbroken devices. So it's really hard to do a lot of uh, the things like um, um, hooking um, stuff uh, on, on jailbroken or non jailbroken devices. So, um, the, if you want to protect your app dynamically while it's running, I would invest time into making sure that it's uh, running on a non jailbroken device. Um, as a self pinning is uh, is an issue on Android and on iOS. So um, that's one that you can take uh, cross platform and, and, and implement well. Um, um, reverse engineering iOS apps might be a little bit more uh, difficult because it uses Objective-C and it um, pushes um, assembly code or machine code. So um, you're doing it on assembly level, whereas bytecode might give you more easy, it's more easier to reverse engineer. So code obfuscation um, is, can still be useful on iOS, but it's, it has less priority, I think. Um, yeah, and just the, the general soft security software design guidelines, like what do you put on the client, what do you put on the servers, it's equally valid on iOS. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, safety net provides security with, uh, by interacting with the server. Do we have something similar that does not require server to be uh, to be interact and provide security within the device itself? Um, at this point, no. But um, I su suspect it coming with um, the verified boot. So some devices on Android have this notion of verified boot, where they can do a remote attestation against the verified boot um, um, part, part of the system, which runs in the secure world. Um, but you still have to do um, the validation server side, because any validation to do client side can be hooked or can be bypassed. 